All right. So tonight we are going to go over anesthesia. Um, well, and I know I had kind of mentioned it, but I think there's a couple of people that have already um, joined since I mentioned it. And then obviously for the recording, for those that are going to listen to it later, when we are looking up anesthesia codes, we always want to make sure in our alphabetic index, we go to the main term anesthesia and we're not looking up the procedure. So that way we're not getting, um, we're not reporting the surgery code. Sorry, we're not reporting the surgery code. We are reporting the anesthesia for that service. So we want to make sure that the anesthesiologist is getting paid for the service that they are performing um, or the CRNA, whichever one it is. So let's look up first um, the number one. Um, let's look this up from a coding from scratch standpoint. So the anesthesia code for a complete removal of the penis, including removal of both the left and right inguinal and iliac lymph nodes. So again, let's go to main term anesthesia. And then under, under anesthesia, what is our anatomic location for the procedure. It's for the penis, okay? So we're gonna go underneath the indention for penis. And then that's gonna give us, right, Sylvia. So we've got 00932 through 00938. Let's go all the way up to the front and look at our 932 through 938. And then which of our codes from 932 to 938 are going to describe our procedure? zero zero nine three six so that gives us the anesthesia for procedures on male genitalia including open urethral procedures radical amputation of the penis with bilateral inguinal and iliac lymphadenectomy okay any questions on that one Let's go to number two. What anesthesia codes are assigned from, for an obstetric patient who had neuraxial labor analgesia provided by the anesthesiologist when the, discover, when the delivery was expected to be a normal vaginal delivery, but the obstetrician performed an obstet or a cesarean delivery when the fetal heart rate dropped? So let's look at this one from a process of elimination standpoint, okay? So right out of the gate, we know we're coding anesthesia, right? So we're going to automatically eliminate letter A because that's the surgery. Okay. So then we have two codes that have 01967 or two options that have 01967 and two options that have 01968 since they're right there next to each other. Let's go take a look at those codes. So right off the bat, we see that 01968 is an add-on code. So we should not report that one by itself. And then we need to decide, do we need both 01967 and 01968? Or should we only report 01967? So again, we're doing um, a cesarean that was expected to be a normal vaginal delivery with neuraxial label, labor analgesia. And then they converted it to a C-section. So yeah, we do need both. Yep, because 01967 is for that neuraxial labor analgesia first. And then we have the add-on code for switching it to a cesarean delivery following that analgesia. Okay. Any questions on that one? 
choosing the anesthesia code is usually the most simple part of it. Um, the next question that we have is going to go over start and stop times. So that's where it can get a little confusing. Okay. So if we remember from our anesthesia guidelines, then our start time is not necessarily when the surgery started, but it is when the care of that patient actually goes underneath the anesthesiologist. So typically it's going to be when they are wheeled into the operating room and they start to go under anesthesia um, and get hooked up. Okay. So question number three, our anesthesia start time is reported as 7.14 a.m. The surgery began at 7.26, finished at 8.18 a.m., and the patient was turned over to PACU at 8.29. So what uh, what's our anesthesia time that we're reporting? So what's our start time? Okay, so the surgery began at 726, but our anesthesia start time is 714. Okay, and then our end time for the anesthesia is what? Eight eighteen. Okay. Again, the surgery finished at 818, but they weren't turned over to the PACU until 829. And that's our ending time. Does that make sense? So just because the surgery finished at 818, the patient is still under the care of the anesthesiologist until they are turned over to the PACU. So they still have to come out of anesthesia and they still have the anesthesiologist still has to evaluate them to make sure that they are coming out of it safely. Okay. So our start time is 714, end time is 829. So then we just have to make sure we read our options very carefully because you can see that there's a bunch of different ones here. So 714 is our start time and then 829 is our end. So that gives us a total of 75 minutes. Okay, any questions on that one? Does everybody understand why we chose the start time and the end time that we did? Anybody have any questions or want some more clarification on that? Hello, can you hear me, Tiffany? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no, um, yeah it, make, it makes sense. I just, um, I didn't know, because it said surgery finished at 818, so that's definitely mm -hmm. a tricky question, but how you explained it, it makes sense now. Yeah. Yeah, so that's very important is remembering that the beginning and ending time isn't necessarily when the surgery started and ended. It's going to be when they go underneath the care of the anesthesiologist and then when that anesthesiologist releases them from their care. And then they go into what's known as that post-anesthesia recovery unit or care unit or something along those lines. Everybody's going to call it different. Okay. All right, so let's look at number four. This is probably the thing that most people struggle with the most, okay? So our anesthesia formula to figure out what our anesthesia charge could be. So our we have our code. So they give us code 00350, anesthesia for procedures on major vessels of the neck, not otherwise specified, has a base value of 10 units. The patient has a physical status P3, which allows an additional extra unit. Anesthesia start time is reported at 11.02. Surgery began at 11.14. Surgery finished at 12.34. And then the patient was turned over to PACU at 12.47. So using our 15-minute increments and a conversion factor of $100, what is the correct anesthesia charge? So does anybody know what our anesthesia formula is? You can come off mute because it's probably going to be easier if you know what it is than to type it all in. 
because it is a semi longer formula. Sylvia says she has no idea, which is totally fine. Yeah, if you turn to um the anesthesia guidelines, it it well, I've got mine written around time yeah. reporting. Yeah. And it's based, it's the base units plus the time plus the PS modifier plus the um QC QC. Um that's the qualifying um circumstance circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, times the um the CF, which I can't remember what CF is. Um, conversion factor. Conversion yep. factor, and that's yep. it's that's, just our conversion factor. And that's put out by CMS. Yep. As, I can't remember. Yep. It's what is it again? It's the um. It's, it's just the, the anesthesia charge formula. No, the um the Q the CQ is the um. The thing by CMS, but that's like the base base that they will pay or something. Okay, so yeah, your qualifying circumstances is that what you're talking about? Those qualifying yeah. circumstances are going to be the the codes that are on page sixty five. That are if the patient is older than seventy, less than one. Um, if there's total body hypothermia, hypotension, emergency conditions, or things along those lines. So those are going to be your qualifying circumstances. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's break this one down. Okay. So this is a, th this one's a pretty big scenario. So we'll probably spend a decent amount of time on this. So our, we're going to break it down from a formula standpoint. So we have base units. Okay. So it tells us here that we have a base value of 10 units, right? So we're going to put 10. Our time, so let's break this down additionally. So what's our start time based on the scenario? So just like we figured out in question number three, what's our start time in the scenario here? Yep, 11.02. And then our end time is what? Shoot. 1247. Oh. Hey, sorry, I'm late. I had I was trying to get it to access it through Facebook and it, it said the meeting was invalid. And then I um and then I found it on found the link through Discord on my phone and then I switched here. Okay, you're fine. So we what have if, what's our total time that we have here? So total time in hours and minutes. One hour and 45 minutes. Okay. So if we have an hour and 45 minutes, how many 15 minute increments do we have? Seven. Yep, so we have seven units. So that's gonna be our time, okay? And then our modifying factors. So modifying factors are going to either be physical status modifiers or qualifying circumstances. So in this instance, we have a physical status modifier of three, and that allows one additional base unit, right? Mm -hmm. And then do we have any qualifying circumstances? Like I said, those are the ones that it takes into consideration. Age, hypothermia, hypotension, or complications uh, by emergency conditions. So do we have any other modifying factors here? No. Yep. Sorry, I'm going to get the rest of this. Did I miss a whole lot? We've only gone over a couple questions. Okay, so that's all of our modifying factors. And then what is our conversion factor that we're going to multiply this with? Yep, 
hundred dollars. One hundred. Yep. So how many total units do we have? Ten plus seven plus one is what? Eighteen. Okay. And then multiply that by a hundred, and that gives us how much of a charge that we should do. One thousand eight hundred. Yep. So that's going to give us our um, charge that we should bill for this scenario with code 00350. So again, this formula here is what Dawn was saying that she has written in her anesthesia guidelines. I have it written in mine as well. But this is a formula that if you have a question like this on your exam, then this is the formula that you'll use to figure out your correct anesthesia time. Hello, mm. Tiffany. Is it question yeah. time? Of course. Okay, sorry. So where did the uh, 10 plus 7 plus 1, I know where the 10 and 7 came from. Just wondering where the 1 came from. It's our physical status modifier that allows the oh. 1 extra base unit. Sorry, where I didn't highlight seven, that whole thing. Where did okay. the 7 come from? The 7 came from the total time down here that we figured out. So this should be the blue that's going to correlate there. 7 is going to be the purple, and then the one is our modifying factor. And then the conversion yeah. factor, let me pull a different color down here. Our conversion factor is going to be this 100 that's going to pull in this 100 here. Yeah, and this coming, on an unrelated note, this coming Monday is when I start my new job. Oh, good. I'll, I'll tell you more. I'll, I'll talk about it more when, when we go through the, after we go through the questions. Okay. Hey, Tiffany, sorry. I don't want to yeah. hold up the class, but. No, you're fine. You're you, fine. Do you have any more questions like this that we'll go over today? I don't have any more in here, but I think I have one or two more. If not, I can create a couple and put them at the end of the document, like later on this week. Thank for you. For you to work on them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on this question for number four? Okay, so let's go to number five. Yes, Sylvia, you are, a, um, are you asking for the formula? Yes, you can write the formula in, but you won't be able to write the question and then like this, you know, work out, but you can definitely write that formula into your guidelines. Okay, and I'm sorry, someone put it in the chat, uh, but I can't find it. What page was this formula on? It's not already in there. I have mine written on page 65. Okay. So just at the top of page 65 in the margin, I have that written there. And then, like I said, that way you can go in and you can write it in, but it's not currently in the book. It's something that you'll have to insert. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's look at number five. 94 year old Medicare patient is having surgery to remove his parotid gland with dissection and preservation of the facial nerve. The surgeon has requested that the anesthesia department place an arterial line. So, what CPT code or codes are we going to report for the anesthesia? So, let's look at this from a process of elimination standpoint. Okay. We have two options that have the 0, 0, 100. So let's go look at that code and see if that matches our procedure. So 00100 is for anesthesia on procedures of salivary glands, and that includes any biopsy. So we are having, we are removing a parotid gland. So does everybody know what a parotid gland is? I don't think so. 
It is, it is actually one of your salivary glands. It's just a more specific. It's one of the specific ones. So you have multiple different types of salivary glands and your parotid gland is one of those. Now, if you're not sure, you can always go to the other codes. So 00300 is anesthesia for all procedures on the integumentary system, muscles and nerves of head, neck, and posterior trunk. So that one d definitely doesn't sound like it, right? Because we're not doing anything on muscles and nerves or the integumentary system. And then 00400 is for anesthesia for procedures on the integumentary system on the extremities, anterior trunk, and the perineum. So even if we're not 100% sure if it should be the 00100, we know it is because the 300 and the 400 are not appropriate. Okay. So then we need to decide. We know that the 99100 is in both. Okay. So we don't have to look at that one from a process of elimination standpoint. We need to look at 36620 and decide if we should report 36620 as well as your anesthesia codes. So let's go to our 36620, which is in our, or in our cardiovascular system. So it's the arterial catheterization or cannulation and sampling, monitoring your transfusion, separate procedure, and it was done percutaneously. So if the anesthesia department, if the surgeon is requesting that the anesthesia department places your arterial line, then we, according to our anesthesia guidelines, okay, so everybody flip to page 64 to your anesthesia guidelines. In the second paragraph, it's your very last sentence. It says, unusual forms of monitoring, such as an intraarterial, central venous, and swan gans catheter, those are not included, meaning we can report those separately. So if the anesthesia department places that arterial line, then we can report that separately because that is not considered a usual form of monitoring. Your usual form of monitoring is gonna be like your ECGs, temperature, blood pressure, oximetries, um, mass spectrometries, things along those lines. But since it's space, it since it specifically says that our unusual forms of monitoring are not included, then we can report those cardiovascular lines or central venous lines, the arterial lines, and the Swan Gans catheters separately. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? And then our 99100 is going to end up being for just so that way we know what they are. The 99400 is because they are 94 years old, and that's our qualifying circumstance that says anesthesia for a patient of extreme age, younger than one year, and older than 70. Okay, any questions on that part? Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt the class. No, no, you're yeah, fine. Where, you're where fine. did you get that ninety-nine thousand hundred? What is that? It is in. Do you have the twenty twenty-four CPT book? No, wait. Uh, no, you, you know I don't have. I'm just yeah, curious yep, if it's in the guidelines. To go say that, it is in the guidelines. Okay, um, I, I you have the that. you have the expert one, right? Yeah. Okay, I don't know how your guidelines are set up, if it's in the guidelines in there, but it should, at least in the CPT, like just a regular CPT, 
um, than it is in the guidelines underneath your qualifying circumstances. Okay, I will I will look up that. I just wanted okay. to know if this is something in the guidelines because I have some there that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As soon as I as soon as I went to go say, do you have twenty twenty four? I remember that you you're my problem child, and you have a different book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get that book. I promise. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. It, hey, it's not cheap, so I get it. Not being able to just buy it on a whim. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions before we move to question six? Okay, let's do number six. I don't know why my spacing got off there. So number six is a 72-year-old patient is undergoing a corneal transplant. An anesthesiologist is personally performing the monitored anesthesia care and then list physical status as P2. So from a testing perspective, we don't have to look at our CPT code, right? Our CPT code is the same for the anesthesia in all four options. What they're testing you on is whether you know which modifiers are appropriate for the scenario. So your anesthesiologist is personally performing the monitored anesthesia care. So yes, Don, you're correct. The AA is going to be our modifier for the anesthesiologist personally performing the care. So we have automatically ruled out A and D. Okay. You also have monitored anesthesia care. So this is not general anesthesia. So what modifier should we use to indicate monitored anesthesia care? QS, I guess. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's our QS. What is that short for? It's not necessarily short for anything. It's just saying that the QS modifier is for monitored anesthesia care. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, I took, I took a week off of reading the guidelines. Yeah. Hope that, hope that wasn't a bad thing. I just needed, I think it's just, it was a little, I don't know if I, that was the best thing to do, but. You'll get there. And then we have our physical status modifier is a P2, which they do give us what our modifier should be with it being a P2, okay? But if they were to say that they had a mild systemic disease or they have a severe systemic disease, then we would have to go to our physical status modifiers to decide which of our P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, or P6. Hello, sorry, me no, again. You're fine. I got a little lost after AA. Where was okay. the QS modifier? Is that under level two hick picks? I'm, I'm not finding it. Yes. So it is a level two hick picks modifier. However, they are not in your um, CPT manual. So what I do is on page 65, I write out all of my modifiers that are applicable. So your anesthesiologist modifiers, okay? You have AA that is telling you that it was personally performed by the anesthesiologist. Okay? You have AD that tells you that they were supervising, I can type tonight, they were supervising um, four or more, or sorry, more than four procedures. You have QK that is um, supervising two to four procedures. And then you have QY that is um, supervision 
of one CRNA. So these are all going to be when they are supervising CRNAs for more than four procedures or two or four. So really this should be like five plus, whichever, whichever type of wording that you need. Okay. So these are our anesthesiologist modifiers. Okay. Then we've got modifiers for our CRNAs. I'm going to do this and make it a little bit easier to split up. We've got our CRNA mods. So we've got QX, that is a CRNA with medical direction. And then you've got QZ, that is your CRNA without medical direction. So if you have a QX, if you have a CRNA that is being supervised, you should always have an AD, QK, or QY claim for your anesthesiologist. And then vice versa. If you have an AD, QK, or QY, you should always have another claim with the CRNA claim. And then you've got monitored anesthesia care that's going to have modifiers. So your QS is going to be for just straight monitored anesthesia care. G8 is going to be for monitored anesthesia care for a complex, complicated, or markedly invasible, markedly invasive surgical procedure. And then your G9 is going to be for monitored anesthesia care for a patient who has a history of severe cardiovascular cardio or, or pulmonary, I can't type tonight, pulmonary condition. So in your anesthesia guidelines, it would be very wise for you to write these in. So that way you don't have to go search for them. Sorry, it is QX. Okay. Uh QS, okay. Yes. Um, Sorry. And then also, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. And then also, what page did you write these in? I have them written on page 65 of the 2024. So at the bottom of the anesthesia guidelines where you have kind of like that half of that column that's blank. Okay. That's where I have mine written. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do you mind, recommend, do you mind write, do you, do you recommend writing that with a pencil or a pen? Um, I have mine written with pen. Okay. Maybe I'll write it later. Maybe I won't. I just, just yeah. kind of, I haven't yeah. marked up my book. My, like I said, you know, I haven't marked up my books that much. So it's just because I just am unsure what to mark. That's all. I'm going to take a screenshot of this so that I can post it in the discord group. Fantastic. And then that way everybody's got it. I am posting it in there now. I'm putting it in the general tab. Okay. So that's why we have to use three separate modifiers. Okay. So AA is for the anesthesiologist personally performing it. The QS is for the fact that it is monitored anesthesia care and not general anesthesia. And then your P2 is because we have that physical status P2. Okay. 
Any other questions for that one? So our answer for this one is C. And then we've got our 99100 because it is a 72 year old patient. So they are over the age of 70. So that um, meets the qualifying circumstances. Okay, let's do another one. So question number seven, a 30 year old patient has anesthesia for an extensive spinal procedure with instrumentation under general anesthesia. The anesthesiologist performed all of the required steps for medical direction while directing a CRNA. So what modifiers and CPT codes are we going to report for the anesthesiologist and the CRNA? So let's do the anesthesiologist first. Okay. Again, our CPT codes are all the same, right? Our anesthesiologist performed all of the required steps while medically directing a single CRNA. So what modifier should we use? AA. Is he personally performing the, the anesthesia? Oh, no, because it says for medical direction while directing mm -hmm. one CRNA. So yeah, it's going to be QY. Okay, so from a testing perspective, we already know our answer, but let's do um, let's do it this way. Okay, so what is our modifier for our CRNA with medical direction? Yep, it's a QX. Okay. So again, they're not testing you from a code standpoint on this one. They're testing you to see if you know which modifiers to use. Okay. Any questions on that one? Number eight, Mr. Johnson, age 82, who has been in poor health with diabetes and associated peripheral neuropathy, is having a FEMPOP bypass. The anesthesiologist documents that he has a severe systemic disease. So what coding is going to be correct for our anesthesia? So in this one, we are going to have to look at codes. Okay. So let's go look at the 01272. Yep. So Tansy, we could also do that. Yeah. We could rule it out with the physical status modifier. So Dawn says a P3. Tansy says a P2. So what is which modifier is going to be for the severe systemic disease? P3. It's going to be your P3. A P2 would be if it was mild. So we're going to use our P3. Okay, so that's going to rule out A and C. We have, it is, um, we can assume that it's the anesthesiologist that's doing it because they tell us that that anesthesiologist um, documents that. So we can assume that it's going to be the AA. So now we need to go look at our code. Okay. So even though it says here that they are age 82, we don't always want to assume that the age is always going to qualify for the qualifying circumstance because there are going to be some anesthesia codes that are already going to take patient age into consideration. So if the, the, the CPT description states the patient age, and we report the qualifying circumstance, they are going to get paid twice for the difficulty. Does that make sense? So let's go look at the 01272 and the 01270. And which one do you think we'll use?
zero one two seven two because it's femoral artery. It's it says has having a fem pop bypass. Okay. Fem pop bypass is gonna be femoral popliteal bypass. Zero one two seven two is a femoral artery ligation. So and that ligation is going to be basically burning it and closing it off. So a ligation is different from a bypass. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I see. I see okay. where I went wrong. Okay. So our FEMPOP bypass anesthesia is going to be reported with the 01270. And then we can use, because there's no mention of the age and the code, we'll use the 99100 because they are over the age of 70. Okay, any questions on that one? All right, so the next two, we're going to go back to ICD-10. Just because we will have conditions that we have to code with anesthesia. So it never hurts to just re-review. So number nine, what is the correct ICD-10-CM diagnosis code for a patient with a post-op diagnosis of a malignant pancreatic mass? So where are we going to go look for this? Table of neoplasms. Mm hmm Yep. And then what is our anatomic location? Pancreas. Pancreas. Yep. And then our behavior. Malignancy. Okay. So what code do you think we should look at in our alphabetic index? Malignant primary. Okay. What code is that? C25.9. Okay. Well, let's just go look at our code description. Make sure that it matches. And then our code description is malignant neoplasm of the pancreas unspecified. So since they don't tell us what part of the pancreas whether it is the head, the body, the tail, the duct, anything along those lines are just telling us very generic malignant pancreatic mass. Okay, any questions on that one? I do. Um, okay. The uh, table, mm -hmm. that, um, where does that go in with this? So because it is a malignant mass, we can assume that it's under the neoplasms. So then we'll go to the table of neoplasms. Do you know where that's located? Yeah, I'm there right okay. now. Okay. So then you'll go to pancreas because that's our anatomic location. And then again, because they don't give us detail of where on the pancreas it is. They're not telling us it's the head, the tail, the neck, the body, whatever it is, right? Then we just go with our unspecified general anatomic location. And then it's a malignant. And since they're not stating that it has spread from somewhere, they're just telling us that a malignancy is present. We can assume it is a primary malignancy. Okay, so actually going to the table is just mm -hmm. to rule out that one thing. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Any other questions? I'm good. Okay. Let's do question number 10. Patient had surgery to remove and replace an existing Hickman catheter, and the anesthesiologist reported a post-op diagnosis of a catheter-related bloodstream infection, or CRBSI. 
So where do we want to go look up in our alphabetic index? What's our main term? Of the catheter-related bloodstream infection, what is our main term? Complications? Well, that's what... Okay. So the complication isn't necessarily like a complication of anything else, right? It's technically an infection is our condition. So if there was a complication with the catheter, if they specified that there's a complication of the catheter, then we could use that. But because we just have that they removed it and replaced it, they didn't tell us what was wrong with it. But our diagnosis is just the bloodstream infection. Then our main term is going to be infection because that's our condition. And I and I know I know what the code is. T eighty point two one one. Okay. So underneath infection. It's going to be due to or resulting from, because it is that catheter related, underneath due to or resulting from, you will go to a central venous catheter, because that's what our Hickman catheter is, is a central venous catheter. And then it is in the bloodstream. So central, so is it central line? Excuse me, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. You're fine, what's that? Is it central, is it central line associated and then bloodstream C-L-A-B-S-I? Oh, wait, wait, I, I misread it. How stupid of me. So like, where do I find it again? So you'll go to infection. Yep, I'm, that's where I am. And then you will go to due to or resulting from central okay, venous right. catheter and then bloodstream. T80.211. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. I'm, You're I'm, welcome. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you guys are here to correct me. So you could go to, cause you did, there are multiple ways to go into the index. You had gone, it looks like infection and then central line associated and then bloodstream. And that would have been appropriate. Yeah. But I realized I misread the, I misread, I misread, you know, the infection there. Yeah. So your T80.211, so let's go back into our alphabetic index, make sure that everything, or not the alphabetic index, the tabular. So T80.211 is a bloodstream infection due to a central venous catheter. And it's got your inclusion notes under there that include the CRBSI, the CLABSI, it's a PIC, um, anything along those lines. So our seventh character, we just have to go to the very beginning of our T80 category. And it is a initial encounter because they are having active treatment. So it's going to be letter B, T80.211A. Okay. Any questions? Anything? I know I promised I'm going to get um, additional of the anesthesia formula questions. I know I, I, I know I have at least one more if I have to create a couple of them to be able to get you guys some more examples, I'll get some out there by the end of the week. Any questions that you guys can think of from an anesthesia standpoint? Yeah, the last one was definitely tricky for sure, but it is. I, yeah. yeah, that one was tricky. Yeah, it is. That's why I wanted to make sure that we are still going over ICD-10 just because most of the time you're going to have an ICD-10 code from a testing perspective. There, there's going to be some of them that'll just be CPT codes. 
But we all know in the real world, too, we can't submit a procedure without a diagnosis code because we have to have a condition or a reason for the procedure with our procedure codes. So, yes, yeah, Sylvia, what's your question about guidelines in general? Are you talking anesthesia guidelines or just? I'm here. Hey, so um, I wanted to ask that all of the guidelines or they're out there somewhere in kind of like in a bundle, like just guidelines, like this is chapter one guideline, chapter two guidelines and so on. Um, I was wondering if there are like a small booklet that contains all of the guidelines, just, you know. Or to... ICD-10? Uh, the CPT and the ICD-10 as well. I, I was just wondering if out there exists something like that. There's like not an additional separate book for CPT. However, for mm -hmm. CD10, CMS does have the PDF version of ICD10 guidelines out there. Um, you, you have can just that, go sorry? To, yeah, so it's CMS. So you can just go to Google and you can just type in 2024 ICD10 CM guidelines and it'll pop up the PDF file from CMS. From CMS. I'm gonna try that because I was just wondering like last time it was that false alarm that we can bring the guidelines on the exam and then it came yeah. out we cannot and yeah. I was wondering if there are any like it's kind of like a bundle or something like that for for it mm -hmm. um no I mean there's not really like a bundle for it um mm, unfortunately that, that is totally my fault AAPC told me and I had confirmed it with three different sources. And then they decided to tell me that all of those sources were incorrect. Um, I'm but, not worried on that. Yeah, I know. I was, I'm, trust me, I was just as upset as everybody else was. Because I got I got excited for you guys that you were going to be able to use it again. And then they were like, no, just kidding. We told you wrong. And I'm like, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so unfortunately, like there's, there's not a quote unquote bundle that you would be able to purchase that has them in there. Um, just because the CPT book has your guidelines just spread all throughout, whereas your ICD-10 is a little mm -hmm. bit more organized. Um, yeah. So really, if you got all of your guidelines in CPT, it'd probably be half the size of your CPT anyways. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, your ICD-10s, you can find those in a PDF that you can print out. Um, but just be wary of printing them out and don't get too used to using them printed out because test purposes, you can't take those into the exam. Um, mm -hmm. So you do have to get familiar with them in your book as well. Okay. Okay. All righty. Thank so, you. You're welcome. So this is with regards to the job, you know, like this is like, like I told you, I have concerns, you know, like, because I still am trying to understand operative reports like I, i'll read the description of the job at, on the posting if that's okay tiff sure. the medical biller must be well acquainted with the computer system cpt and icd-10 coding with and with the clinic's charges this individual must be available to assist the billing and coding manager in monitoring the overall efficiency of the department to ensure accurate patient and insurance billing they must possess knowledge of admin and clerical procedures and systems such as word processing, managing files and records, stenography and transcription, des designing forms, and other office procedures and terminology. Daily charge entry, weekly billing, for example, setup, printing and sending, response to billing phone calls and questions, maintain billing tracker for any pending info needed in order to ensure clean claim submission and avoid timely denials. And so, like, like, I mean, they had asked me in my interview if I was familiar with operative reports, and I said I was, but I think I should have said I've just seen sample operative reports. Do you think I'm really in trouble? No, no. I mean, once you get in there and you start to see them, then you'll be able to know what to pull out of them. Um, I mean, it's, it's like one of those things that you're, you as a biller shouldn't really be doing a whole lot of coding from scratch. You might be working with whoever is coding those operative reports. Um, but you won't be the sole person pulling out that information. And another thing, too, that I'm a little worried that I'm, I think I'm most worried about is, hang on just a second, let me turn my light on. Ah, there we go. That's better. Um, is 
is the word says, you know, response to billing phone calls and questions. And prior six years ago, I had two jobs as a customer service agent where I was let go from within four months. Do you think I'm going to have to be interacting with customers a whole lot? I don't know necessarily that, I mean, you might have to work with the patients and the customers, but I think most of like your billing stuff will come from you conversing with insurance companies. Um, I mean, there is a possibility that you'll have to, it just depends on how your office is structured um, as to whether or not you're going to be taking calls from the patients. I, like, I mean, I mean, like, like, yeah. And the the other thing too is like, I'm, I, 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 I've, 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 I've been in my study guide for over a month. I currently am on chapter 11 because I've been kind of going a little slowly, but I've been distracted a lot. But do you think if it takes me a few months to finish my study guide and then going back to practice exams, that won't, that won't be the end of the world? No, not at all. Yeah. Cause I just, I want to make sure I take the exam before the end of this year, before they start integrating. And I've tried coding from scratch on the operative reports without using the answer key on a couple, but I still get them all wrong. Yeah. Well, and it's just practice. I mean, the more that you do them and the more that you read your rationale and become more comfortable with them, um, then you'll get a lot better with them. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not anything that you're expected to have hundred percent accuracy. Like as soon as you jump out of the gate with anything, even whenever you get in, like into a coding position, very few are going to expect you to heat meet 100% accuracy and 100% production on day one. They're going to do what's called a ramp up process um, where you might, the first couple of weeks, you might be expected to do 25%. And then four to six weeks, you might have to do, you know, 50 to 70%. And then they'll end up ramping you up to meet that production and quality expectation. So yeah. and I'm, I'm just a give yourself some grace. I, I, I understand. It's just that I want to, yeah, like with this new job, you know, I can be, I'm excited, but, I, but I'm also nervous. Yeah. And I think that's a natural feeling. I think even, even, yeah. now, I mean, I've been in the field for 17 years and every time I start a new position, I get those nerves too. I mean, that's and just a natural it's for feeling. An, it's working for an eye doctor. It's, yeah. it's for an eye doctor. So my mom had said, you know, you just won't, won't have to worry about like, It'll just be more focused on like the, the Adnexa system. Mm -hmm. Well, and the good thing too with ophthalmology codes, there are not that many codes that are out there for ophthalmology versus if you were to go into a cardiologist's office, right? Because we know that the cardiologist section is a lot larger than, the, you know, the eyes. So that's going to be a good advantage is you're, and you're going to be working naturally in a smaller code set. And also, yeah, I mean, I think I... I had said to them the skills, even though I, I think, you know, I'm really struggling ICD 10 CM and CPT. And the thing I learned from a medical coding video on YouTube is like, just cause you list it as a skill doesn't mean you're an expert. It could mean, exactly. you, know, you know, how to use it. Like, like I know how to use the coding manuals and I know how to, I know, I know how to look up codes. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you say that you're, you know, you have knowledge of them like you said, doesn't mean you're an expert in them. It just means that you are familiar with them. You know how to pick them out, um, but you're not well versed per se. Yeah, that that's encouraging to know because, like, I when I when I heard that, I was like, okay. I was a little worried was I, if I was dishonest in my interview, but thankfully, but I just got to trust that God has a good reason for this, and and I, if He allowed me to get this job for a reason. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope I don't fail at it and get fired. And thank you for your encouragement, Tiff. Absolutely. You are very welcome. Hopefully you will flourish. And I'm sure you will once you get in there and you just get more comfortable with things. Um, yeah. You know, I'm you'll, you'll prove that you do, you know, it, it's going to be a learning curve, right? Because it's going to be your first yeah, I'm, really I'm well aware of that. medical position. That's what, yeah. That's what I've been asking a lot of. That's I've just been telling, I've been asking a lot of my friends, you know, to pray saying this is going to be a steep learning curve for me. Yeah, 100%. And, and it, learning, I, and, and, just, and that's the thing is, is, I mean, like I said, I've been in the field for how many years, and I still learn. I just learned something well, new in the last week. So, so I think for me, yeah, I have I, autism, so it makes me slow to learn some things. And I just hope that I just, I mean, I, I mean, I, it, will, it will start by shadowing the training, and then the supervisor will shadow me. And I want to get to the point where the supervisor doesn't need to shadow me all the time. Right, right. And I'm a and, yeah. Well, thanks again. Sorry, I kept this too long. I just wanted to, get to, to talk. I wanted to talk with you about this. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. TNG, did you have a question? 
Yeah, just a quick one. Um, so I've been studying for almost five months on and off though. So, you know, two weeks on, two weeks on. I mean, two yeah. weeks off, two weeks on. Do you think two weeks is, because I know all the general information, but today was a bit tricky for me. Do you think two weeks of studying modifiers and guidelines, do you think that'll kind of give me enough time to perfect it and then pass the exam? Have you seen that happen? Um, I mean, yeah, I've seen people definitely do that last minute review. And, and I mean, you're still going to be learning things in the next two weeks. Um, yeah. So have you taken any practice exams yet? Yes, I did take one practice exam. I have two more exams to take. I'm going to okay. take another practice exam here in a week just to see where I'm at. Yeah. Um, and then I'll get scheduled to take my, like, if I score over like 80%, then I'll schedule myself to take the exam. Yeah, absolutely. And then one of the things that you can do too is go back through all of these questions from the study groups. Um, they are in um, the, there's, yeah, they're, they're in the um, Google Drive where the uh, questions are, where the questions are located, obviously. Um, sorry, my brain just okay. like stopped working. Um, but yeah, go through back, go back through all of those questions and get a little bit more practice with those two. Um, and okay. then that way you have different, different question sets that you're looking at and not always looking at, um, you know, the same within those practice exams. Yeah. You know, the practice exams are, the questions formats are way longer. Like they're like case questions almost. There are going to be some that are going to be longer than just a couple of sentences. There shouldn't be that many that are super long, like case questions. You should only have 10 case questions. Um, but you might have some that are, you know, like question number four, where it's, you know, a couple sentences, but it's not a full page type thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, thanks for having a good session tonight. Um, we are a couple minutes over, so I am going to go ahead and end. But if you all have any questions. That was my fault. No, you're fine. You're fine. If you have any questions, throw them in the Discord chat. Um, I will get to them over the next couple of days, kind of as life decides to not be so crazy. Um, but any questions that you guys have, don't hesitate to reach out. If I can't answer it right away, you know, I know that there's a couple in the group that are really good about um, you know, answer and if they can. Um, so don't hesitate to lean on the group for support as well. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much again. And I will chat with you guys next week and we will go over evaluation and management. Have a good night.